Um, so this presentation is really fun for us because we've we always give presentations about our work that are very specific to a project or are very specific to like the outcomes of a work. Danny, of course, just talks about mostly um, about toilet paper. And so we made this presentation especially for this um, for this class because Alan asked us to share our journey and we were really excited to kind of look back at where we started and who we were and how we ended up here and how design has kind of shaped our life. Um, so we're really excited to share this very personal presentation with you. We were a little self-conscious because there's a lot of like I in this presentation or a bunch of pictures of us. So I hope you forgive us for that and that you enjoy it. <laughs> so I'm gonna go first. Um, I'm the lion's part. And I, today I'm a designer in wildlife conservation. And so I just wanted to tell you a little bit about that story. And so before I go into this, there's a few pieces of this presentation where we're gonna ask you for your thoughts or like there's a question that's gonna come up and we're gonna use the chat. So I love to start that off. Um, if everybody could please write, what is your favorite animal in the chat just to get the chat going? That would be great. I'm gonna pull it up, make sure I can see it. Mine's a red panda. Red panda. Pig. I love a real pig. <laughs> Sloths, good one. Ooh, blue tongue skink for specific. Wow. I like it. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Feel free to keep throwing animals in there. I love it. This is super fun. Um, so I want to start my chat first with this in um, talking about research and talking about what it really is to be a creative, mostly because this is one of my favorite things about design. Um, how if you're, I mean, I know you know this, but if you're a designer who really focuses on perfection, you don't really get anywhere. Like part of the beauty of being a designer is to be able to get dirty and be able to get in the mud and find all of these imperfections. There's a famous proverb that um, talks about how if you have water that's too clear or too perfect, you can't have any fish survive in it. And in the same way, if you have soil that's too pristine and doesn't have, you know, crap in it, literally, then it doesn't really grow um, as many crops as you'd want it to. It's not as fertile as you would want it to. There's a lot of beauty in that, like, imperfect perfection, quote unquote, in our process. And so um, to me, that's one of the most important parts of being a creative. And I, what I was thinking about my journey, honestly, my journey is so muddy and so full of imperfections and full of mistakes. And it's just crappy all over um, that I wanted to start with this. And I think it's training as a designer in the mud that really makes this design process perfect. And so I started training when I was very young. Um, as I mentioned, my process was very crappy and I meant that very literally in that I've never been afraid of having a little bit of crap on my hands. I've always really loved animals and that just kind of comes with that story. And so like here you were thinking oh, this presentation was gonna have the crap part be Danny's part, but you know, <laughs> it's, it's everywhere. It's also in mine. Um, and so, now, um, now that I've shown you this, like, of course, I've always been really obsessed with animals and you would think that this is where my journey started because that's where I'm now. But the truth is that it started pretty far from there. It really started with cars. Um, I started college as a car designer. I was super obsessed with cars and it didn't entirely come out of nowhere. I, um, my first job when I was 17 was as a car mechanic for Dodge, Jeep and Chrysler. And so I did brake pads and I was just like this greasy little teenager that was kind of hidden in the back of the shop. And I did oil changes and like, I just cleaned stuff, honestly. As I've always mentioned, I was never afraid of getting dirty. Uh, but I really loved engines and cars and stuff. And so that took me to design school in Europe. Um, and I loved it, but kind of, like there was always something kind of off about it. But it wasn't until a couple of years in that I really realized why it was wrong. Um, I remember one day I was in a drawing class and I asked the teacher how to draw something that I didn't know how to draw. It was like 
this three quarter view of a car and I had to draw the, the back of the fourth wheel because it was like a really open design. And this is the drawing teacher. And I asked him, hey, how do you draw the, you know, the inside of the fourth wheel? And the teacher looked at me and said, like, that's too hard. You should change the design so you don't have to do it. And I was like, how is it possible that the, the, the drawing teacher is telling me to change my design so I don't have to do something that's hard? And it really kind of came together of all of things that were wrong with that school. And so um, I had heard that this amazing school in, in LA was called Art Center College of Design and that it was a great design school for specifically for transportation. Um, and so I took a while to build my portfolio and apply. During that time, all of my, um, like all fellow students and teachers and everyone was like, you're not a good enough student. Like you're never gonna get it. This is gonna be terrible for you. It's a really stupid idea. But I did it anyway. And I worked on my portfolio and I was really excited to, you know, prove them wrong. And then of course I got rejected. <laughs> and at that moment, what really clicked to me was that all of a sudden I had a school that was willing to give me a diploma within a year or so, um, the one in Europe. And then there was this other school that wouldn't take me as a freshman for the first year. Like I wasn't good enough to even start. And that hit me hard. And I realized that I was spending a lot of resources and time and everything on a school that was probably not gonna be right for me. Um, so I sold all my stuff and I left and I moved to Los Angeles to try and figure out how to get in. And it took a while. Um, I didn't have a visa. And so I got into community college to study anything. I studied oceanography, Russian, car mechanics. Um, I studied, I don't know, like super random stuff. And just to get 12 units of credit so that I could be legally in the United States. And in the meantime, work in the portfolio and apply to the school. And so long story longer, I got in. Um, but during that time where I was working on this portfolio, I realized that I didn't really need to apply to car design anymore. And I didn't want to apply to car design anymore. The in-between um, was this process that led me to understand that design was about the structure and creative process that was that like really had the potential to make great changes. And so I love thinking of design was teaching me how to think instead of teaching me how to just make a thing and then have it be out there. Um, and so while I was doing this and like really considering whether design for cars was the right path for me or not, then um, I had this teacher tell me, well, you may love ice cream, but you might not want to scoop it all day. And that was it. I was like, oh my God, I love engines. I love cars, but I do not want to spend the rest of my life drawing bumpers and wiper blades. Like this is where it's really wrong. Design I have now learned is this amazing tool that will teach you how to think, how to really understand super complex problems and how to solve for really complex problems. And you can do really amazing things in transportation and there's a great opportunity for it, but it was just a, it wasn't the opportunity for me. And to be honest, back then, I didn't even understand that. I just thought like cars, engines go fast. And I didn't see the environmental connection, but I still don't think it would have been right for me. Um, so I ended up joining Art Center at that point, but I was super focused now on being a product designer for social impact. And at the time, it wasn't really a thing that quite existed all that much, but a little bit, like it was barely starting at IDEO.org. There was a group at Continuum that was kind of thinking about it. Like there were these little pieces around that were thinking about it, but it wasn't huge, but it was it. I was like, okay, this is it. You're gonna use design to look at the world with a critical eye and do problem solving. Um, and so my career came, became entirely focused on how do I use design for social change and to make changes that are really positive in one way or another. So then at this point, I graduated from Art Center um, and it wasn't very clear what to do with this degree. And I told people that I was gonna do social impact. Like it was a cool thing to do in school but it wasn't very realistic to do in the real world. And there was one job I saw that was actually possible 
which was the IDEO.org fellowship. Um, but I was highly unqualified for the job. They posted it online to ask for people who had five years of professional experience. And I had, well, none. I had just graduated from school and I was super green. And um, the thing is that I thought, well, if you don't apply, you already have a no, right? Like what's the worst that can happen is that I spend a lot of time on a portfolio and an application and then it doesn't go anywhere. So I worked for like a month on my application. And in the meantime, I was doing super random jobs. Like I was doing logos for some crappy fashion companies or like anything to you know pay the bills on the side, but focusing on this portfolio. Um, and then I applied. And then I so didn't think I was gonna get the job that I got a puppy, which is a terrible idea to get before like the super heavy travel job. Um, but it worked and I got in, I couldn't believe it. I swear, I could not believe it. I remember in the middle of the interview, I was, um, I was in, in this interview and the people I was interviewing with asked me, like, why should we give you this job when you have no qualifications for it? Like, they actually point blank asked me that. Um, but it somehow worked out and it was an amazing experience. I learned a lot, traveled a lot, met a dude. Um, is good. I'm not going to get into details on that. But then it really set me up for amazing work after where um, I did a lot of work focused on Latin America, like mostly around water challenges on education issues on reproductive health in Tanzania that was in Latin America. Um, and then finally ended up at the International Rescue Committee at the IRC. And this was a, a spectacular opportunity that I had to take. At this point, Danny and I were living in Colombia and we decided to move back to the United States, um, to New York for this. And Airbill was, was phenomenal, honestly. I'm not, again, I'm not gonna get into details because this is mostly like a whole journey and I wanna tell you more about the animal side, but um, it, at the IRC, I led teams that worked on like child immunizations during post Ebola when there were families who were afraid of the medical care centers. And so how do you convince mothers to bring their kids in even though they're afraid of doctors? Or later I led a team that was redesigning the refugee crisis in the United States. So, you know, how do you really understand the experience of being a refugee landing in the US and then what do your first weeks and months and years look like? And at this point I quit. I mean, the job at the IRC was amazing and it was a dream job, but I think it was a dream job for someone else. And I needed to go um, partially because I was properly burnt out. And the reason why I like to share this is because I think that it's important to talk about burnout. Um, Burnout is real and empathy fatigue is real. And I was definitely suffering from this. And I thought that being strong meant that I had to just keep fighting. But I think being strong at that point was to say like, actually I need a break and it took me too long. I know I made mistakes during my last project, just doing stupid things that I wouldn't have done otherwise. So I think it took me too long, but I hope it never happens again, which is why I like to share this. Um, if you feel burnt out, it's important to recognize it. And so I stepped away from the IRC and it was a time to say like, okay, so, you know, now what? Like I could go back to this, but there was something that was calling me to that past, to who I was when I was a little kid, which was, you know, this girl. It was like, okay, there's something here about this girl that she's not gonna let it go. I was like, my obsession with animals goes beyond all the things that you can imagine. <laughs> and um, so anyway, so I left thinking like, okay, I'm gonna be a designer in wildlife conservation. This is the goal, this is the dream. And as soon as I left and started looking for a job in conservation, I realized like, oh crap, this actually doesn't even exist. And so it took a long time to figure it out. Actually, I don't know that I have figured it out, but it took a long time to understand like where do designers really fit within wildlife conservation? 
And I didn't want to give up because there weren't any jobs available. I actually wanted to spend the time understanding why aren't there any jobs available. And so for the last three years, this is what I've been working on and you know, finally doing projects in wildlife conservation and starting to open up those doors. And so I'd like to share a little bit with you about what this means. And so like, if we really think about design, you know, design, and you, this is the more traditional definition of like design is a practice that uncovers why people behave as the way they do and it creates solutions um, by pulling together all of these uh, trifecta of things, right? Or to put it like really simply, very, very simply, design makes changes based on human behavior. I know this is extra simplified. But then if you look at conservation, most conservation issues are actually rooted in human behavior and human choices in one way or another. So if you oversimplify that, most of these problems are rooted in human behavior. And then you have this other field that's looking at human behavior and how to shift it. And this can be, for example, in the US, like a culture of overconsumption or a culture that doesn't really fix things. Um, single use plastics, just be using single use plastics or making sustainable purchases. Like I, I think this guy's gonna tell you about sustainable delivery. Um, and all these things are connected to wildlife because it affects all of their environments and we're making choices on the environment, on the ecosystem, right? But then you can also think about a lot of ways in which we can impact wildlife in a very direct way and also in the United States. So here I'm gonna ask you to write on the chat again. What do you think is the most dangerous animal in the United States? Just shout out. Ooh, Ooh man's a good man, one. <laughs> a good one. I think man is actually the answer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, but aside from humans, what do you think the second most destructive creature is? Mosquito is a very, very good, um, very good suggestion. It is true of the world as a whole. Ooh, rats is a good one. Tiger. Way, <laughs> side note, uh, did you guys know that the plague still exists? Like the old plague, like the black plague still exists in like squirrels and other rodents around the world? Um, in the you can, US. You can cure it now with antibiotics. Can, but can you imagine like going to the doctor and saying like, listen, I got good news and bad news. The bad news is you've got the plague. Yeah, that one. The good news is here's some antibiotics. You'll be fine tomorrow. True. Um, anyway, you've got some answers here. Beautiful. Snakes, also a very good answer. The real answer to this is deer. Deer kill more humans in the United States than any other animal. Um, it kills more than 200 people a year. And, <laughs> nice. Christina for the win. <laughs> okay, here's one more. What body part do you think is most bit by snakes in the United States? You know? That's what I would I would have guessed. Ankles. Ankles. Nose. Nose is very good. Okay, all very close. Ooh, neck. <laughs> Vampire snake. Okay, the answer is the hand, specifically that area. Because people see rattlesnakes and they go and try to grab them and get bit by them. And so when you really think about like what we call a human wildlife conflict, which is when humans and animals are fighting over resources of all kinds or interacting in ways that are not beneficial to each other. Um, human wildlife conflict is the second most, the second largest threat to wild animals in the entire world. To answer the question of why, Joy, um, it's hard to answer. I mean, Darwin comes to mind. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, just to pick it up, this is crazy. So um, there are many other ways and you, you can also work specifically on wildlife conservation issues in the US, like for example, keeping wild pets. This is a huge issue, like Tiger King, anyone? But also keeping, you know, reptiles and guanas and whatever, all of those things in homes, like it's a huge 
issue that has a lot of repercussions. Doing things as simple as keeping trash out for bears um, is a big deal because of a three strike law that exists where if bears are seen in certain places after the third time they're killed. Um, and then just understanding zoos. Zoos are a really complex subject that there's a lot of things about zoos that are terrible. There's a lot of things about zoos that are really important for conservation and just boycotting zoos altogether is actually not very supportive to the wildlife um, conservation in general, but being able to navigate that really complicated world at the end of the day can be very much a design issue, which would be a fascinating one to do. So um, kind of to sum up, basically this is my role now. I work to put both of these things together and to make it really clear, not just for designers that they can work in conservation and that you don't have to be a biologist or a veterinarian to do it, but also for conservation to understand that design is not about like um, just logos and graphic design or GPS trackers, because that's the only design that they're really exposed to, but that they can be really amazing critical thinking partners and that we can work together on this stuff. So from here on out, this is me. I always digging in mud for solutions, making mistakes, um, but I'm really excited about this path and I'm confident that uniting both of these fields could be an amazing thing for us as humanity and for wildlife in the future. And with that, we'll pass it to toilets. <laughs> awesome. So part two is toilets. Um, as Alan said, um, and Mari alluded to as well, I um, spent a lot of time thinking about toilets and toilet paper. Um, so this is about how I have flushed my career away. Um, my story also starts when I was young, but um, much less altruistic than, uh, than Mari's story. Before I was a designer, I was an entrepreneur. Um, and I actually, my first business was in the recycling industry, but uh, it was specifically selling used Playboys. Um, my friend and I, when we were in fourth grade, somehow found our way into a rec the recycling center in our town. And we found a stack of Playboys in the magazine section. And like, I, I was in fourth grade. I didn't know what a Playboy was really, but I knew I wasn't supposed to have one. And so what do you do when you're in fourth grade and you see something you're not supposed to have, you take it. And when we took it, we realized like there are probably other people who want this. And I think we sold them at for like a quarter or a dollar a piece at, a piece at school or something like that. Um, and so my first business was was when I was in fourth grade, and um, I went on to other glorious, uh, you know, career milestones like selling fake CDs and selling fake Rolexes, and um, then like uh, selling fireworks. When e the first year that eBay was open, I would sell fireworks online um, to people around the country. All terrible things. Um, but, yeah, of course, but of course, I also did have a, um, a, a side that wanted to, to design things. I, throughout high school, I also loved cars and loved car design. And um, I, I remember doing a lot of origami and thinking like, I really wanna, um, I really wanna make things. And so I ended up going to Pratt and uh, where I met Alan and um, studied industrial design there. I ended up making a lot of things that I thought were really brilliant, like this tooth fork here, uh, which is like, you know, why need why have two products when you could just have one? I still think this is brilliant. Um, <laughs> I also spent a lot of time making furniture, and this this piece, this uh, bench here, was inspired by um, you know those like old cool old '70s jackets that are like slick velvet on the outside, but on the inside there's like this crazy paisley pattern or something. Um, so it's like pretty minimal on the top, but then on the bottom, you've got this like crazy velvety texture that's a paisley pattern. Um, so I thought these were really great, but ultimately I really did struggle in industrial design. And I remember going to one of my mentors because at the end of the day, I was learning how to make things in mass. And I realized like I was going to be making a whole lot of crap in the world. Um, and this was important to me because um, these are my parents here in the middle. My, um, my father was an anthropologist and um, uh, studied the impact of um, the U.S. military, um, the U.S. military's presence on the people and the culture of the Marshall Islands. Um, that's my mom next to him who, who helped him with his studies and then went on to work in nonprofits her whole life. And ultimately, both of them were activists um, throughout their, their personal lives, but also throughout their careers and really taught me the value of doing things that I believed in with my time. Um, and so while I loved the act of making things, I was really struggling with this idea that design was just making more crap that we didn't need. 
Um, so I studied, um, I started to find my way into what was called at the time sustainable design, which was like, you know, putting two words together that hadn't really put, been put together before that. Um, and we were all trying to figure it out together. And I think we still are. Um, I ended up continuing to make furniture design. This was um, a, an internship I had in college where we would collect, all, you know, we would drive around to like a hundred different wood shops in New York and collect all of their different scraps and laminate them together and make furniture out of these, these um, scrap pieces of wood. We were also experimenting with new materials, like this was bamboo had never really been used for furniture before, but we were really on the cutting edge of, of trying to make bamboo. I should say it has been used for, for a long time to make bamboo, just not in this context. Um, so I really enjoyed doing this and I had a lot of cool internships doing this throughout my time. But I ultimately grew tired of making tables for rich people. Um, I realized that it just didn't align with my bigger theory of change. Um, so I applied to work at Method, uh, the cleaning products company based in San Francisco. And ultimately Method is a dream job for a designer. It was basically taking um, your skills as, as a designer to sell a more sustainable product to people who otherwise wouldn't really care about sustainability. Unfortunately, like Mari with Art Center, I also got rejected. Um, I ended up, um, you know, moving to San Francisco anyway, asking my future boss if he'd have a coffee with me since I didn't really know anyone there. That coffee turned into lunch, that lunch turned into drinks, that drink, those drinks turned into dinner. Before I knew it, he was asking me to come back to the office the next day for more interviews and he ended up offering me the job, which was a, quite a victory in my book. And while I was there, I designed toilet bowl cleaners, which was a, a fortuitous um, uh, future, uh, future seed of an idea. I also designed a lot of packaging for things like this, um, the OMOP, it was a, a more sustainable version of a Swiffer. Um, and I really loved um, the job, but ultimately um, what happened was that the recession of 2008 hit. Um, I survived two, two rounds of layoffs at Method and I thought I, was, I thought I was safe for a little while longer, but I started thinking, what would I do if I lost my job? Um, you know, and I'd been to South America the year before um, and I was thinking, you know why, maybe I, I've always wanted to work with nonprofits doing social good as well as environmental good. Maybe I would just like move somewhere cheap like South America and, um, you know, consult for nonprofits or something like that. I didn't really know what I was gonna do, but I started thinking and I realized, wait a minute, my plan B is better than my plan A. Like, that's amazing. Why am I here? Like, I, I, I ended up walking in the next day and quitting Method and moving to, to Argentina. Um, I co-founded a, a, a consultancy down there called Black and Blue Design. Um, we did a lot of work, none of which is worth showing you. Nothing really very good came out of that, but I did have a lot of fun and learned a lot um, before I moved back to the States. Um, I ended up working at IDEO.org um, where I met Mari, of course, but I also did a lot of really amazing work. I fell in love with um, issues like reproductive health and realized what a, um, a huge issue it is globally and um, ended up designing services like this, which are, uh, it, it's a reproductive health service for teens in Zambia. I also ended up doing some toilet design and realized that toilets are just the best. Um, this is a prototype of a toilet in Ghana um, that we ended up working on. There are a couple of different rounds of prototypes that we lugged back and forth between the States and Ghana. We worked on the branding of this toilet and ultimately we, what we ended up designing was this. Um, and uh, this toilet is still in distribution in Ghana, um, operated under a, um, a business called Clean Team. And what we developed with Clean Team was this really interesting model, right? Like here in the States, and I think where many of you are dialing in from, we, we're, we're used to having our toilets connected to some infrastructure. But in a place like urban Ghana, where people are, you know, much more transient and don't have much home ownership, living in incredibly dense um, environments, um, have really low and highly variable income, um, the thought of building infrastructure was just really out of the question. So even building a, a basic pit latrine was out of the question. So what we developed was a service, um, and that toilet was basically, um, you know, a two-part toilet. People would use it. They would pay, pay to essentially a small rental fee. And then a couple of times a week, someone would come around, open that toilet up, take a cartridge out, replace it with a fresh cartridge and take that cartridge back to be um, emptied and treated. Um, and ultimately the waste would actually be converted into, it's now being converted into steam to sterilize the cartridges that are being put back into the system. And so this was Clean Team and it was a really exciting project to work on. 
um, for a number of reasons, but most because it taught me that I love toilets. Um, and it sounds weird. I know it's something we all take for granted. It's something that not many people talk about. Toilets are, are one of the three most life-saving inventions in the history of humanity, up there with improved agricultural practices and antibiotics, right? So it, it saved well over a billion lives, yet there's still two billion people in the world who don't have access to a toilet. Um, and it's interesting from a chemistry perspective and a biology perspective and an engineering perspective. And as a designer, it was really interesting for me from a cultural perspective, like every culture thinks about toilets differently. So um, a, a bit randomly, I decided to leave IDEO.org and uh, co-found a toilet paper company. Um, and the reason was it combined my love of toilets with um, my love of products and my love of, of trying to have um, a positive impact on the world. And ultimately, at Who Gives a Crap, the basic idea was that we wanted to align the products that we buy with our values, but without making compromises. At the time, there were like a bunch of um, eco-friendly products you could buy, but they were all really bad quality or they cost a lot of money or were inconvenient to buy. And so we really wanted to flip that on its head and basically make a, a toilet paper, starting with toilet paper, a product that was made without trees where we donated half of our profits to help build toilets. And that was 100% delightful in every way. And as a designer, like a product designer, this is our actual product. It doesn't look very designed and I understand that. But ultimately our perspective was innovation isn't always necessary where you think it is, right? So as a product designer, my instinct was like, let's get in there and like explore different textures on the toilet paper and like, let's rethink the form factor and let's, what if we didn't need toilet paper at all? Um, but ultimately what we realized is that the product itself is pretty good. What we really needed to rethink was the whole experience around it. So we started the business with a crowdfunding campaign. Uh, I convinced my co-founder to sit on a toilet on a live stream um, until we raised our first $50,000. And this was early days of crowdfunding. So it took about 51 hours um, of him sitting on a toilet online, I, which I don't think he'll ever forgive me for, but I, I won that one. Um, and this is our product, uh, our toilet paper product now. Um, we've got a, a recycled line, which is the colored ones and the bamboo um, edition, which is the black and white edition. And ultimately the, the goal, whole idea was to design the whole experience around the product. Um, so the packaging and the whole experience, what we've created is um, a brand and a product that our customers love and are really passionate about. And so there are tens of thousands of photos on Instagram of people being creative with, with our toilet paper whether it's um, posing for you know, uh, sexy photo shoots in the upper left or giving out rolls of toilet paper instead of slices of cake at, at this couple's wedding in the bottom, uh, bottom right. Uh, we have people painting portraits of our rolls and um, you know, making protest signs out of our packaging. And ultimately that comes back to the design of the whole experience. Um, we're releasing tomorrow, I believe, our next limited edition. A couple of times a year, we do limited editions. And the whole idea is like, how do we get people to have more fun with their toilet paper and to leave it out for people to see or take pictures and put it on Instagram? And so for this year's holiday edition, um, we basically created um, what we call the A to Z edition. And every role has a few different letters printed on it. So you can write different messages like buy more TP or I love you or happy birthday or things like that. Um, so excited to like continue experimenting with how the product is, um, is really being thought of and designed. We have more products now. We also have paper towels and tissues and we recently launched this dream cloth, which is a reusable alternative to paper towels. And over the years, we've grown a lot. We started in 2012 and we now have 100, over 100 employees in five countries and um, growing really quickly. Um, and I love this GIF um, and uh, we made it when we celebrated our first million dollar donation, but it's quite a bit out of date. Um, we've now donated over $5.7 million um, to help build toilets. Um, ultimately though, our goal is much bigger than this. Um, so our goal is to make sure that everyone on earth has access to a toilet. Um, and like I said, there are about 2 billion people in the world, 2 billion with a B, um, people in the world who don't have access to a toilet. So um, we're going to keep working and, um, you know, keep uh, experimenting with how we can design a more delightful product experience. Um, and so that is um, my story told very quickly. I'm sorry for rushing through it. 
Um, but we did want to briefly talk about bears. Um, and I have to warn you that this section is a little bit forced. Squeezing bears in here was a bit of a stretch, but we figured we had the lions and the toilets and we had to somehow connect it. Um, so I'll hand it over to Mari. Yeah, so th this part will be fairly quick. Um, and we are very self-conscious about how much we're talking about ourselves in this presentation. We're not used to that. So bear with us. Um, but so this starts with, uh, I remember my first day at design school, we were doing this orientation thing, you know, you walk around school and stuff. And so one of the teachers that was guiding us around, um, just like asked the students, well, do you have any questions? And one of the students asked him, what is the best part about being a designer for you? And he answered, well, because to me, the best part about being a designer is that design doesn't end at the office, that it affects how you plate your breakfast, how you look at a garden, how you organize your socks, or how you notice beauty in small things. And it was beautiful. When Alan asked us to share our story and who we are as designers, it was really hard to leave that part out. Um, and so we wanted to share just a little bit of like, what is our daily life and what that looks like outside of our work. Uh, so in some ways, design affects our life in many ways that I think would be more obvious. Like this is what our work life looks like. And so of course, like post-its are around and they we use them for the most mundane things. Um, they're just always around. But then Danny also proposed to me on a post-it that I couldn't find a picture of. But he said, like, will you marry me? And then it had little check boxes, yes, no, and maybe. <laughs> um, and then this was our engagement announcement. It was also on post-its, of course. And so naturally, we use them to plan our wedding. Um, and the point here really isn't about the post-its in particular, but more about what they represent. What is really great about them is that you're, by using them, implying that it's something that's movable and changeable and adaptable. Um, and it's just a different way of looking at things. And so honestly, when we were planning our wedding, we started doing it, the, you know, the big party and the fancy dress and like all that stuff. And we hated every second of it. It was a nightmare. Um, it kind of felt like a performance for other people instead of just what it was really about, where we just, we wanted to be married, but not necessarily get married. Like the process wasn't all that important to us. But there were a few things that were. Um, so we just kind of scratched that whole thing. And then we decided to take the goal of, okay, what is it like to be married? Like, how can we get to that goal while accomplishing the few things that we want in the process, which were to see friends and family, which by the way, at this point, between Danny and I, we had lived in more than eight cities just because of how our life had led us to that point. And so doing a wedding necessarily meant that it was gonna be a travel wedding and it was gonna be bringing people from a lot of places and mostly just not seeing a lot of people. So um, we decided to do a tour. And what we ended up doing with this tour was that instead of getting married in one night, we used the exact same budget and turned it into one month. Because weddings are so expensive for no reason. Um, and so we took it for one month through all of these cities and we got to see most of the people that we wanted to see. So we started by getting married in the desert in Nevada. My mom helped me make this dress that I love and actually could still wear, which is like weird, right? For a bridal dress, like it's just a white dress. And she made this beautiful dress for me. Um, our dog was there, Elvis was there, and that was it. It was just us. And then from there, um, we got the 70 Buick to take us on this road trip that we took from Las Vegas through like LA and San Francisco and New York, which of course it totally left us stranded on the freeway <laughs> heading north to San Francisco. And we dumped it in a parking lot and then took a cab the rest of the way. And we called the rental company like, oh, we left your car back there. Um, it was amazing. This wedding tour was, better than what we could have dreamed of because we spent a lot of time with all the people we wanted to see but in really tiny groups we got to reuse the hell out of these clothes like over and over again and it was just really personal and it 
it felt a lot better than the, this big show for one night. So it was really special to us. Um, so that's story one of our life, life designs. And then Danny will tell you one more. Yeah, and I think this one will be um, pretty quick, but ultimately, um, you know, throughout our life together and independently, ultimately, I think we think as designers and that we try to understand what's the real problem we're trying to solve why do people solve it in a certain way and can it be done better or differently? Um, and so when you think about it, 2020 has been really the ultimate design challenge. It's been a, a bit of a clusterfuck of a year, pardon my French, but um, it's, been a, it's been a challenge. Um, and so in the beginning of the year, of course, we did what I think a lot of us are doing. We were living in LA and uh, we couldn't go to the office anymore. And we, did, we had a tiny, tiny apartment that had a great balcony, but it was a tiny apartment. And so we started saying like, okay, we don't have enough space to both work indoors. So like, let's build, let's make an outdoor office. And so we started to embrace 2020 and, you know, embrace our, I, I was getting a quarantine, which um, I was quite proud of at the time. But at the end of the day, um, you know, it was a really challenging year and it has been a really challenging year. And um, I remember at one point I was sitting on a couch and looking over at Mari and she had this, this smile on her face, which she only has when she has like a crazy idea. <laughs> I was just like, what, what's going on over there? And she's like, oh, nothing, I'm not done with it yet. I'll show it to you later. And um, I was like, no, what is it, what is it? And she ended up showing it to me. And what she had was essentially a pitch deck. Um, and uh, it was a pitch deck called Danny and Mari Make Lemonade, a guide to carefully organized irresponsibility. Um, and ultimately she had, she was basically questioning all of the assumptions we had about this year, right? We're told you can't leave your house. You're not allowed to be um, close to people. You um, have to always wash your hands. You can't use public restrooms, all of these things. And she was basically saying like, everything is happening to us. How do we rethink this and take a little bit of control? Um, and so basically the whole pitch deck was um, geared towards trying to get us to buy um, this, uh, which was like a, you know, a really cheap little um, uh, trailer camper that she found on Craigslist. Um, and basically go on a drive and like explore for a month, right? Like hitch it to the back of our car in LA and go for a drive. And we went to go look at this. Uh, by the way, I saw this pitch deck and I was like, I'm in, let's do this. Like let's own 2020, let's, let's do this. We went to go see this thing and it was absolutely Amazing. terrible. It was like totally falling apart. And like, we wouldn't have made it more than a hundred miles from where we bought it. Um, and so we rethought things again and we basically said like, okay, why don't we actually really think about what the real goal here is? And we realized we really want to see our family who's on the East Coast. We don't want to fly to them. We have all of our animals with us and so we, and we can't leave them anywhere because like everyone is, everyone is poisoned this year, right? It's <laughs> sort of what we were being told to think at the time. And so what we ended up doing was we ended up driving cross country in this van, which we call Moose. Um, might be able to see our cats and dog in there. We had two cats, a dog, and two humans in here. We basically took a month driving cross country. And of course, Mari spent a lot of time looking at wildlife along the way. This is us in Yellowstone looking at some, some buffalo. We ended up in Vermont um, in October and spent the month of October watching the leaves change there and really fell in love with Vermont. It's really not like it had never called to us before. We have a deep connection to it from a family perspective, but We've always been city people and we really took the time to really embrace this idea of slow living. And while we were there, we stumbled into this house that we really liked um, and we decided to move there. And so in a couple of weeks, we're gonna be moving to Vermont, which is a totally random and uh, ridiculous decision to move to Vermont in the beginning of the winter. Um, but the house we're moving to is on Beartown Road, which is how we connected to bears. bears. <laughs> uh, so lions, toilets, and Beartown Road is um, basically the theme here. Um, and so we wanted to share just a few high level thoughts on the summaries here, and I know we're running out of time, but you can jump in here. So yeah, very quickly, don't be afraid to get dirty because um, brilliant things can come out of impurities. Design doesn't stop at the office for us. It's been a lot of fun and it's been great sharing such a personal story with you. I, we hope you've enjoyed it. And the public health message, don't forget to flush and wash your hands. And um, that's it. Um, so thanks for letting us indulge in sharing a little bit about our story um, and how design has really taken over both our careers and our lives. Um, and 
happy to answer any questions you guys might have. And Regina, I see you said something about night soil men. That is that was very much um, an inspiration and a challenge for us when we were designing Clean Team. There was a really negative historical um, understanding of um, people who dealt with waste. And I think that's true in a lot of cultures. And so in Ghana, night soil collectors, as they were called, um, were um, really considered taboo. Um, and so we really had to sort of rethink that and um, get, get around some of that, which is where design came in and how we designed the uniforms and the whole service to be really trustworthy. Any questions or feedback or ideas? I never heard you talk about the night soil men. That's cool. Yeah. Thanks, Regina. Uh, here is a uh, feedback that I heard that uh, Ellen has invited you several years ago, but I think this is perfect time. Like we have you right now, because <laughs> if, if it's not right now, we don't, we won't have the <laughs> the bureau <laughs> that that story. I love it. It's just, <laughs> yeah. it's just like so surprising me and I, that that is a story that makes me happy today thank you oh thank you susan that made me happy yeah so as a vermonter i have to ask what area are you guys moving to <laughs> it's in underhill in chittenden county um so like that that mountain behind us uh, our house is mount mansfield nice yeah where are you from? Um, I'm from Franklin, which is top left corner. Um, I was about five miles from the Canadian border growing up. Nice. Awesome. Uh, this is Joy. I loved uh, your talk and the personal side. That's what made it. That's what makes it real. So, um, and it's true. We can't turn it off, right? As designers, everywhere you go. Amen. So yeah, yeah, it's but, whether, you, whether you like it or not. <laughs> exactly. Um, I have a question for Mari. Um, when you were talking about the different ways that design can uh, show up and make a difference in conservation work, it made me think of um, Chasing Coral. Are you familiar with that documentary? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so the creator, having come from a marketing background and realized that a big part of the problem was people couldn't see the issues. Mm -hmm. So he used the film as a way to say like, well, you can't, like, you can't tell what's happening to the coral because we never, we don't see it in our day to day. And a bleaching event actually looks beautiful, even though it's really bad. So um, how much have you realized that it's just the, the power of storytelling and like visualizing the issues for people um, is as much of the conservation play as like changing our behaviors through, you know, the way we perceive the products or mm. replacing it with better products. Yeah, it absolutely is. Um, I've noticed, I mean, for me personally, it's been a really hard challenge is to storytell about design. So I've had to take it on kind of full on what's the right way to storytell this other story to get to that point. So yeah. storytelling is a big deal to me. Um, from the conservation side, storytelling luckily is one of those things that I think conservationists understand very quickly. And so as part of their budgets and as part of their goals, they do have the storytelling side a little bit clearer, as well as funders understand that. And so funding is a little bit more flexible for people who want to do photography and film. So what I found is people who want to go into conservation will immediately think of like obviously the biology veterinarian side or the like Nat Geo photographer filmmaker side. But to your point, I don't think a lot of people think of beyond like, you know, going off into the bushes and taking pictures of like the charismatic megafauna, as they're called, but more of like really understanding what is happening with coral. And even though it looks beautiful, there is really something else that we need to be focused on. And um, there's a lot more that can be done with storytelling for sure. Awesome. Thanks for the insight. Um, yeah, I think for me, thank you so much for uh, sharing your story. Um, it was uh, really fun and um, uh, interesting to see how you got where you got to. Um, I think usually idea is the end goal. Um, and it's, uh, it's really cool to see how it was the beginning of many, um, many adventures for you guys. 
Um, I have a question. Do you feel like the fact that your your designers um, kind of puts pressure on, um, as you've said, <clears throat> excuse me, designers is an after hour thing as well, um, where people are like, oh, what are you guys going to do because you're designers? So you, you're potentially going to do something in a quirky way or in a funny way. And you're like, no, we're just going to, you know, have regular glasses or, um, <laughs> you know, um, yeah, that's the question. Yeah. I, I mean, I can say that like, uh, yeah, we've never been the aesthetic design, like we love beautiful things, don't get us wrong. But um, I think partly because our, we've literally never lived in an apartment together for more than more than a year, um, I don't think. Ever. Yeah. Um, we move a lot. And so collecting things has always been really challenging. And so we're somewhat minimalist and have gotten really used to using just like Airbnb furniture and whatever Ikea plates they happen to have wherever we're staying. Um, so that part has never been a huge challenge. Um, the I think that for, I can speak for myself, which is that sometimes I feel pressure in my relationship with Mari in that she uh, she doesn't take anything as it's supposed to be, she questions everything. And for me, sometimes I just wanna do things the normal boring way. And um, so I feel um, a great sense of pressure to like rethink everything rather than saying like, actually sometimes you can just like have a regular table and like have plates and eat, you know, at normal eating hours and you know, these other things that we, uh, society has accepted. I can be very boring. <laughs> I, we have plates. <laughs> We have plates. Yep. Um, no, that's a really interesting question because I feel like a lot of designers do feel that in like the way they dress or the way they do certain things. But no, I don't feel that much <laughs> pressure, although now I'm more self-conscious about it. <laughs> Alan says we want to see the plates, please. Uh, Alan, we are in Jocelyn's apartment, so we can show you her plates. Our plates are in storage. Everything <laughs> we own is always in storage. So um, we don't really own much. <laughs> Any other questions? So what's next? What do you want? What do you expect out of Vermont life and work from Vermont? Mm. Oh boy, yeah. Oh, 2021 is, is an interesting one to plan. Um, for the beginning, at least till the summer, we're expecting it to be quite remote. My job has been very challenging um, because the case study I'm working on is in East Africa, in Uganda. And the team is all over the place. There are two team members that are in Uganda, but one of them is in Kampala. And then the other one is actually in the field, like in the villages where we want to do the work. Um, but it's been really challenging, not only because of the travel side, but also because we've started to rethink why we need to travel. And so we have a team that's like, the, the woman who lives in Kampala is from the UK. She's a white woman from the UK. I'm a Latina living in the US. Um, one of our team members is, is Ugandan from the villages, living in the villages, but we do consider like, is it, is it really necessary for us to travel there and why are we traveling there? And is it better to really find designers who are from Uganda, even if they don't live there or finding design talent within Uganda, which is, it's pretty hard, but, but it's not impossible. And, um, I think I'm starting to rethink why I travel. And so hopefully Vermont will be a place where I'll spend more time, um, but maybe learn to be a better delegator and, and be more inclusive um, of designers from, from East Africa. But I have to tell you, I don't have answers. I have a lot of questions and I'm still working through it. That's on my side. Uh, I'm gonna make some more toilet paper, and, uh, <laughs> donate some more money to make more toilets. Uh, no, I think, um, one of the things that's exciting to both of us is that one of the challenges when you're on the road so much as we have been for the last many years is that it's really hard to make things, right? Like if you need, if you want to cut something out with an X-Acto knife, you have to go to the store and buy another X-Acto knife and another cutting mat. And um, I think we're both people who we were never the best craftsmen or never like never motivated just by the aesthetics. Um, or the, I speak or, for yourself. <laughs> there were many motivations, including aesthetics, but um, 
but I think we're both yearning to get more hands-on um, and 2020 has taught us like, you know, I fell for the whole sourdough craze and, um, you know, with the camper van, we really went to town and modifying it. And so I'm excited to have our tools out of storage again and be able to, to build things. And, um, you know, on the, on the, who gives a crap side, we're, we're building a, a pretty substantial business at this point. You know, we have over a hundred employees and we're looking to double that in 2021. And so um, managing all that remotely and really leaning into the new products is going to be a big challenge on its own. So, um, so we'll, um, yeah, I've, I've got my hands full at work, but I am looking forward to like getting my hands dirty when I'm, when I'm not working. Yes, Bethany, Ron is an amazing place to have animals. We, as we mentioned, have three, but we are also fosters whenever we can. Um, so we've had a lot of dog fosters and cat fosters, which I'm so excited to have them again. And then I'm also figuring out how to do, um, you can be a certified wildlife rehabilitator. So be able to bring in endangered species or just like squirrels, like orphan squirrels or something. Um, and you go through this whole training program of how to deal with, you know, anything from like rabies to orphan babies and then re-release them back in the wild, which Danny's really excited about. So Alan asked, so the apartment we're staying in is our good friend who happens to be the co-founder of IDEO.org. Um, he asked to see her plates. So this, these are the plates of the co-founder of IDEO.org. They're from Crate and Barrel, made in Thailand. You're pretty, pretty standard plate. Yeah. <laughs> Hope that helps answer and resolve your, your questions there, Alan. Uh, I have a question. Um, Thank you so much, Mari and Danny, for that talk. Um, and Mari, I was interested in what you said about um, how you're reconsidering travel this year. Um, and it reminded me of a question I had about, I guess, both the animal conservation work that you do, but also with for Danny with Clean Team and other initiatives. Um, I'm interested to hear more about um, your work in other countries, um, specifically Ghana and Africa, and, and I guess how you thought about um, navigating that space um, as a non-Black person and um, as a person who's not Indigenous to that environment, um, and how you thought about sort of coming into a community um, that maybe you weren't um, native to or weren't a part of and, and designing for solutions for those populations. Yeah, go for it. So um, that's, an, that's a really good question. And I think it's worth starting by acknowledging that it's, it's been a journey and we're still on that journey, right? And so um, I think there's, there's been a growing awareness of understanding um, the privilege we have to be able to walk into other communities and be able to um, leverage our power to be able to make change. And so wielding that power um, and understanding the responsibility and the, the, the different ways in which we can wield that power has definitely been like a journey um, throughout our careers. Um, one of the reasons why I left IDEO.org, and I think we both had our own reasons, many of which overlapped, but um, one of the reasons why I left is that I, I, I believe in the organization and the, and the power of design to, to create change in the world, but I didn't believe in, in the international development sector as it was happening. And as a consultancy working for these clients, ultimately I, I felt like um, you know, we were not really getting to the root cause of some of these problems, which are structural inequalities um, related to like how our international capitalist system works. And so I left because I was uncomfortable working on these sort of incremental solutions that we were designing that ultimately were just going to help put more white people in SUVs in the capital cities around sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and so that was one of the reasons why I left in terms of like, the role of design and so there's like a lot of power in working for these um these organizations that you have to be wary of in terms of the role of a designer coming in and being sort of a translator i guess between cultures um i was always uncomfortable with that um in some ways um it's impossible to like you know not recognize like to, to not be aware of one's whiteness when you're walking through one of those, the, the areas in which we were designing um, in every sense of the word. Um, but as designers, you know, we, 
we're essentially taught that we're translators and that we're there to try to understand people's um, people's needs and advocate for those needs to, to create solutions that were more effective for them. And so I think at the time I was, um, you know, comfortable with the idea that we were helping to create solutions that would be that would better suit the needs of these people than had we not been there. Right. And so, um, you know, assuming zero sum game there where, um, you know, if we weren't there, it would have been worse than if we were there. But I think what I didn't think of at the time was, were there other solutions that would have been um, developed that would have been better than had we been there at all? Or were there other challenges that we were creating that we weren't even aware of? So sure, we might have designed a better toilet system than had we not been there. But maybe the fact that we were there to designing toilet systems was creating problems to begin with. So um, I, I left the consulting world before I really came to terms with a lot of those issues. And so I never really fully resolved them. Um, but it's a great question that I think like your generation as you're coming into these, um, these fields ha has a lot of questions to answer or to try to find answers to. And I, I'm curious what your thoughts are on this because since you're still sort of working in that world, albeit for, for wildlife. Yeah, I mean, even though my work is for wildlife at the end of the day, it's like I mentioned, it's about people. So the project I'm working on is on elephants and our, our cat has now jumped into the wine glass cabinets of ID.org's co-founder. Um, <laughs> thanks. So a, I'm trying to thought. Oh yeah, so my the project I'm working on is in um, Uganda and it's about elephants, but it's not really, it's really about people. It's really about farmers who have big, um, not big, they're actually small scale farmers who have one acre to about 10 acres of watermelon, corn, groundnuts, like um, various different crops that elephants love to eat. And so what's going on is that the elephants are coming in and they're raiding all of these crops. And so in one night, a farmer can lose their entire income for the entire year. And that usually has repercussion on children's school fees. That's just kind of how, how things are working out in this, in this particular region. But human elephant conflict is something that happens in every single country that has elephants across Asia and Africa in general. And so it's a really big issue. And one of the things that I was upset about when I really walked into this is that I realized that when conservation comes up with a solution, they will immediately think that the best way to disperse this is to give it away for free. And that was what was happening with this new elephant repellent. This elephant repellent is the type of like a organic homemade spray that you put around these crops and it stops elephants from destroying it. But the immediate thought was like, let's give away the recipe so that people can make it, or let's give away the product, just like make it and just give it away for free. The problem with both of those is that the recipe was not gonna get made. And that was something that we found through a lot of research um, and it just won't happen. And then giving it away for free as a product is just something that is extremely paternalistic, entirely donor dependent. And then it completely devaluates that product and you're not building um, a strong marketplace for this product that could actually have a really well-structured entrepreneurial system. Um, so I jumped in as a service designer to be able to understand all of that. And so all that being said, I was gonna go in May and do a prototyping trip. I have already done the research trip and we're out there to do a prototyping trip and understand what was the best way to do this um, entrepreneurship model. And right around that time, of course, was when the pandemic hit and then the trip got canceled. And recently, about, um, about two weeks ago, um, I was writing with my colleagues and what I heard from the team in Uganda was that they said, you can still come. It's not something that the, the village is open to. They're very wary of foreigners, but if you talk to all of the leaders and if you talk to the government leaders, as we always do, but you know, if you talk to the government leaders, you'll get permission to be able to come um, and just make sure you have that permission in case people on the street see you and report you. And the, that really hit me because I realized that this is absolutely white privilege happening. 
there is no way that I would get that permission um, when this is an area where it's very clear that all of the people in these remote villages are very uncomfortable by foreigners coming in. And foreigners could be from Kampala. Like they're just nervous about people coming in from the outside where there are more cases of coronavirus because they don't have many cases yet. Um, yeah, of course, there are not many reported, but in these particular regions that are so remote, they actually don't have that much contact and they've been able to close them off quite well. And so I didn't feel comfortable taking that on and saying like, oh yes, I'll just like wield this, app, this absurd power to show up and make people feel uncomfortable and potentially bring some virus over to these places that don't have the healthcare system to be able to support this. And that was really the last domino that knocked over this whole project where I have to really rethink it. Like I want this case study to happen because it's important to show what design can do in wildlife conservation. It's been three years in the making. It's been very hard to get to this point, but we can't be willing to take this this power and plow through people in order to get the case study. It just doesn't work. And so I'm trying to rethink how to do it and if it should still be done. Um, I hope it can still be done, but can we do it in a way where maybe I can erase myself out of the narrative? Um, and I, I'm still not sure how to do that. Thank you for that answer. Um, and thank you for how personal that answer was and also how personal this um, this entire presentation has been. It's wonderful, thanks. I wish I had better answers so far, but <laughs> maybe we'll have more answers later. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, I'm just curious to ask if anyone is interested in either wildlife or conservation issues altogether. Um, just, not you. <laughs> um, no pressure to say yes. I'm just curious to know. I would say um, I definitely do. I think animals have always kind of been a part of my life. Um, I grew up with like cows and chickens and cats and dogs, um, but I never really thought about it through the lens that you guys have framed it. Um, and I think it's actually really cool to think about it kind of as a design problem. Um, I don't have a lot of hands-on experience with like not my own pets, um, but it's a really cool area and I think that it's super cool work. That's awesome. I love that. I saw that also and said yes. Um, I'm gonna drop my email, although I'm pretty sure you probably already have it, but feel free to reach out to me if you ever wanna chat about like a path in conservation. I also won't have great direct answers, but I'm always happy to, to chat about it. You can always write me if you wanna shoot the shit. <laughs> Get it? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> the puns never end, the puns never end. Um, <laughs> I, one thing I wanted to say, I, so I, most of my colleagues are overseas, and so I spend a lot of time working in weird time zones, and I just want to give a shout out to everyone who's on this call from a, a different time zone. Um, uh, I think we've got like South Africa, I don't even know what time it is there right now, and Korea and China, um, but um, kudos to you all for um, working this into your lives, even though it's at, I'm sure, a crazy hour. Absolutely. I'm glad you said that. Yeah, that's a beautiful note to close out on. Thank you so much. Um, this was such a personal and generous presentation to all of us. Thanks for everyone for coming. And um, yeah, we're gonna look forward to more adventures, more stories of your adventures in Vermont. This is yeah. amazing news. Yeah, we might just like I think. end up in a pile of flannel, like, I don't know, with cows or something, <laughs> who knows. Thank you all so, so, so much. Yeah, thank you guys for having us. And Alan, thanks so much for finally making this happen. So glad we, we got to it after all those years. Uh, all you too. And I agree with the comment that the timing was perfect. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Susan. Cool.
Thank you all and have a great day or night or whatever it is, wherever you are.